Hello and welcome to my channel, Olushala Live. My name is Olushala Taiwo, and I thank you for tuning in, and I welcome you to the book reading of Our Mother's Sore Expectations by Kenge Adeola Ayemi. Chapter 5 is where we continue today. If you like anything on this channel, please go ahead and let me know. Feel free to subscribe and also to share it with others. This is an amazing book and we're now on page 124. I hope you get to read the other 123 pages before this one. And um, yeah, and at the end of the reading, I'll let you know how you can get a copy of this book. Here we go, chapter five. Adewale was angry that he was used to execute a coup and was not rewarded as he was promised. He was not given the governorship of Western Region and the promotion to a big brigadier general was denied him. He could not understand why Rahim would go back on his promises. He delivered the Western Region of the country to him smoothly and powerfully too. Very angry and hurt though he was, he was not an impulsive man. One of his good qualities being that he was actually a patient and calculating man. He was able to delay gratification and work on things for their long-term benefits. So he swallowed his anger and resentment and continued his job at his post in Ibado as if nothing was amiss. Two weeks after the transition to the new government that year in 1974, Rahim invited him to the presidential palace in Lagos. When he arrived, he had to wait for the whole day before he was finally called in to see the new president of the country. He toyed with the idea of going to pay Muji a visit as she was in the building and probably catching a glimpse of Amina, who was a toddler at the time. He wondered whom she looked like, him or Muji. He remembered his mother pleading with him to get married and start to have children so that she could have grandchildren to proudly carry on her back and show the world. He imagined his mother carrying Amina on her back. He thought of this for a while, but decided against asking to have an audience with the First Lady. He felt that it might not be wise. Rahim obviously was not fulfilling all the promises he made to him for good reasons. And if he knew that he met with his wife, things could be more complicated. So he sat in the waiting room for eight hours. He read all the newspapers and magazines there. He had several cups of coffee and soft drinks and gawked at the parade of people coming in and out of the president's office. Many army officers and civilians in high positions passed through the waiting room that day. He knew all of them as he made it his business to know who mattered in any situation. Most of them did not recognize him, and whenever he introduced himself to them, they would explain that they had heard so much about him and expressed their pleasure at finally meeting him. So, because of the meetings with all these people, he was not too angry that he was kept waiting. It allowed him to do some networking as he knew that all the people were coming to ask for one favor or another, and for one position or the other from the new president. Finally, at six o'clock that evening, Rahim met with him. The older man, <coughs> excuse me, came round his huge desk and embraced him in a tight hug. Adewale, he looked at him for a while, holding onto him, shook his head in amazement and hugged him tightly again. Where will I be without you? He asked the younger man. You are an amazing boy and I owe you forever and ever. If there is anyone closer to a man's heart than a son he loves dearly, you are that son to me. Thank you, thank you, he said to Adiwali, while still holding him away from him at arm's length and looking deeply into his eyes. He hugged him again. Adiwali hugged Rahim back and told him that he was always happy to serve him. You are probably wondering why I changed my mind about the governorship I promised you, eh? Here, come, sit down next to me and I'll explain everything to you. He drew Adiwale with him to the couch and sat very close to him. You have to understand that even though I am now the president, there are other people who have to be satisfied for things to run smoothly in this country. You are still a very young man. You are not even 40 years old yet. You have plenty of opportunities ahead of you, which a lot of these generals don't have. And I don't want to put you in a situation where you'll be the envy of all. It wouldn't be good or safe for you. A lot of them are wary of you as it is. You are a brilliant young man and very good at what you do. You just took over the strongest army division in the country 
where you where you executed your side of the coup and without a drop of bloodshed too. I am impressed. You and I have to sit down sometimes and you have to tell me your strategy. He patted his thigh affectionately and chuckled to himself. Adewale wanted to take him by the neck and strangle him until his eyes popped out of their sockets. But all he did was to smile and say to Rahim, thank you, sir, but you had the hardest job in the coup. Sir, you took over the capital. Rahim chuckled some more and continued, I realize that you are the only one I trust. You have always served me and courageously too, without any complaints. I want to give you this proposition I am about to offer. I want you to give this proposition I am about to offer you a lot of thought. If you don't want it, I will understand. And I wouldn't hold anything against you. As it is, I am indebted to you a great deal. I want you to be my aide de camp. ADC, Adewale thought to himself, I have never been so humiliated in my entire life. He wants me to be his ADC? Rahim interrupted his thoughts and said to him, take your time. There is no rush. And like I said, if you don't want the job, I will understand because I know that you like your current post very much and you're doing a great job as it is. Honestly, I wouldn't mind for you to remain there as you will continue to keep an eye on things for me. Like I said, the Western region has the strongest unit of the army in this country. He, he leaned towards uh, Diwale some more and in a conspiratorial tone whispered to him, and frankly, I don't trust that idiot, General Ido, who is the current commandant there. So either way, you will be helping me a lot and that's why I will not be angry at your decision. Adewale thought to himself, everything now makes perfect sense. He understood why he had not been promoted to Brigadier General as promised and why he did not get the governorship. Rahim would never give him either. Rahim was the one envious of him and he needed to keep him under his watch in Lagos where he would be able to monitor him every day. Rahim was impressed, all right, that he captured the Western region for him peacefully and smoothly in the coup, and he was afraid of him. He knew that if he was able to do that, he could plan a coup of his own and succeed too. He could become the president of the country tomorrow. A lot of things also made sense to him. There had been another colonel who came to Ibadan three days before the coup on a pretense that he came to attend a friend's wedding. He had come from a cantonment in Sokoto, he had come up to Adewale in the officer's mess at lunch and introduced himself. They had chatted for a while and shared a beer. It had nagged at him for a long time that day, especially that the officer who was getting married was a much younger and junior officer. He asked the colonel how he had become friendly with the groom and he told him that the younger man had served under him. Adewale had not believed him and made a mental note to check out the story but he never got around to it. Besides, the other colonel had asked him a lot of questions, even though they had been about his job, with the other man claiming that he had the same job in the northern region. Adewale had felt that he was too intrusive. Then he had seen him around the base too much. It was as if he was following him, and each time Adewale had gone up to speak with the man, he was always friendly and chatty. He had hung around too much for someone who came for a wedding. He confirmed his suspicions with what Rahim was saying. The man had been there to watch him and ensure that he had carried out his end of the coup well and not sell out to someone else. I have been a fool to think that a Fulani man would trust a Yoruba man totally. There aren't other generals elsewhere envious of me. The only one envious of me is Rahim sitting with me here right now. He said to himself, he also realized that he did not have any other option but to become his aide-de-camp. Sir, Adewale stood up and saluted the older man. It has always been my pleasure to serve you, and I don't have to think about becoming your aide-de-camp at all. It is an honor, and I'll be an idiot not to accept. Rahim stood up and returned the salute. He smiled broadly and embraced him tightly again. Thank you, Adewale. Thank you very much, he said. And when Adewale looked at him, there seemed to be tears at the corners of his eyes. Adewale was given two days off to get his affairs in order and return to his new post. He moved into a section of the residential part of the presidential palace. Even though it was very much in the same building, it had been built to give him a lot of privacy. 
and he needed not see the occupants of the main section of the house. It was also a very comfortable and tastefully furnished apartment with four bedrooms and four and a half bathrooms. It had two living rooms, a study, and a very big kitchen. Adewale checked the security system of the palace and speculated that it was easy for Rahim to kill the former president. It might be easy to kill Rahim as well. He toured the whole palace thoroughly, going into every nook and corner of the palace, and he found the security grossly inadequate. It was easy to infiltrate the palace and corner the occupants in without any means of escape. He discussed this with Rahim, and the older man's admiration for him increased, that he was concerned about his welfare. Rahim gave him the go-ahead to do whatever was needed to ensure their safety. Adewale had become friends with Richard while he was in the United States, training to become a combatant in the mid-1960s. Richard, who worked for his father in a construction business, building bridges and dams, had not been in the academy at the time, but he had a lot of friends in the academy. Adewale invited him to the country and gave him the contract to build several tunnels in the palace. One of them went from a walk-in closet in Muji's bedroom so that nobody would know that it was there and opened into a standing cabinet in the kitchen in his quarters. Another tunnel from the basement, which they built in his quarters, tunneled the palace and emerged in the center of Obalinde neighborhood in the city. Other tunnels were also constructed from Rahim's room, the presidential office, and from the kitchen in the executive offices of the palace to connect with one another underground and emerge in several parts of the city of Lagos. He impressed upon Richard the secrecy of the project, and Richard's company built the tunnels working only at night. On completion of the project, Adewale memorized the blueprint before he destroyed it. He instructed Rahim and Muji as to the ways to get out of the palace via the different tunnels in emergency situation, and he gave them the keys to the several doors. He also had an alarm system installed in the palace, especially the presidential living quarters, and had bulletproof doors and windows installed. Adewale saw Muji for the first time two months after she became the first lady. The three of them, when she and Rahim hosted the president of Egypt and his wife. The three of them went to the airport to meet the guest's plane. Muji shook his hand formally as she was getting into the limousine to sit with her husband, and she avoided looking at him in the car all the way to the airport. She was about six months pregnant at the time, and she looked radiant. She seemed to be getting lovelier with age, Adewale thought to himself. All through the course of the state visit with all the dinners and functions that she and the president attended with the visiting dignitaries, she ignored him. She, he was relieved that she had set that tone for their relationship. He had wondered how he would cope if she started making demands on him like she did after she had Amina. Adewale's relief had come too soon. However, because on Saturday morning at about two o'clock, a week after their guests departed, Muji knocked on his bedroom door and an alarmed Adewale got up with his gun and slowly opened the door. She pushed her way into his bedroom and pushed his gun away from her. Put that stupid thing away, she commanded him. That is all you men think about, your penises and your guns. Adewale was too shocked to speak for a while. He did not like her there. Rahim might call for him at any time, and he had actually come down once to his apartment, though he did not walk into his bedroom like his wife just did. What do you think you're doing here? He asked her in a state of panic as he hurriedly put on his pajama top. I have come to talk to you. Don't worry, Rahim won't miss me. He is sleeping with his first wife today. And that is what I have come to talk to you about. Things are not like you promised me that they would be. I hate everything in this place. Rahim doesn't even touch me anymore. Ever since I became pregnant, he has been sleeping one, with one of his other three wives. He sends for one or the other, and they come down and stay for a month, and then he sends for another one. I complained about it, and he said that he didn't want to hurt me in my delicate condition. What delicate condition? I'm pregnant, not sick. He slept with me throughout the other time I was pregnant with Amina, so what is different with this situation? I pointed that out to him, and he said that 
that was a lot different. And this, this situation is different. For one thing, I wasn't the first lady when I was pregnant with Amina and I didn't have a heavy schedule like I do now. And he said that he thinks I need my rest as much as possible and so he wouldn't sleep with me until the baby comes. I protested and he bought me a Mercedes Benz. What am I to do with the Mercedes Benz? I can't take a Mercedes Benz to bed. I can buy myself 10 Mercedes Benzes if I want them today. And I told him that. I have been very angry with him and I told him that things will continue to be that way until he sleeps with me again. She paused, took a deep breath, and continued. Then a month ago, he told me that he wouldn't send for the other two wives anymore, and that his first wife would move in with us and take care of me and help with Amina. I don't want that woman here. Do you know that Amina likes her more than she likes me? My own child calls that woman Iya and calls me Muji. Can you imagine that? Iya means dear mother in these Fulani people's family. So that woman is dearer to my child than I am. Yesterday morning, Amina fell off her chair while she was eating breakfast and started to cry. I got up to go to her at the same time that this woman did. Do you know that Amina ran past me and ran to the woman who scooped her up and started to comfort her and kiss her? Amina started to tell her of how she fell off the chair. And the worst part of it was that my child, who I thought wasn't speaking yet, was speaking in fluent Hausa to this woman. The only ch language my child speaks is Hausa. Adiwale, and I don't understand a word of that language. Each time I speak to her in English or Yoruba, she babbles like a baby. That is why she was, when, that is why when she was born, I complained to you that I hardly saw my child. All of them had her with them all the time. And they always spoke in Hausa to her. Even Rahim speaks in Hausa to her. I suggested to him that we speak in English to her so she can understand the language. And he told me that we're not English. We are Fulani and that he speaks in English all day at work and he doesn't want to come home and speak in English again. He said that she would learn the language and when she starts school, that he, had ne he never had much of, of, much of school and he speaks English now. Each time I speak in Yoruba to Amina, he tells me not to do so. I am a Yoruba woman for goodness sake. Then he insists on calling me Fatima. And he said to me, my name will be officially changed to Fatima. So I told him that I'm not having any of that. My father named me Mujisola. That is my name and nobody is calling me anything else. He let me have that. What will I do? My child doesn't speak my language and probably thinks Iya is her mother. I am in trouble here, Adewale. So she started to weep. I decided that I would have to do something about the whole mess. So I hired a nanny from England. At least if the nanny spends a lot of time with Amina, she will learn to speak in English. Rahim went berserk when he found out about that. I am losing my child here and my husband too. I am not gaining anything from this whole arrangement. Iya is Rahim's closest confidant. He tells her everything in Hausa, she concluded, sat down heavily on the bed and continued to cry. Ariwale moved over to her, hugged her to him and said to her, hush Muji, it is going to be all right. Everything will be fine. You are probably feeling overwhelmed with the pregnancy. Hush, how will everything be all right? I live with people who I don't understand what they talk about all the time, she angri angrily retorted. You'll have to learn the language if you hope to keep your daughter. You are no match for the whole lot of them, Adewale patiently told her. Learn the language? I can't learn the language. This is Lagos. This is a Yoruba city, for goodness sake. You support them, don't you? You support them taking everything from us. You have to remember that Amina is your daughter as well. So you are also losing a daughter too. The girl is 100% Yoruba and we are losing her to these Fulani people, and you stand there and tell me that I have to learn their language too? What's the matter with you? She shouted at him. Hush, hush, Adewale said, as he moved closer to her and hugged her to him again. At the same time, put his, his hand across her mouth to keep her quiet. Hush, Muji, he said to her again. You are making too much out of everything. Amina is not my daughter. She is your daughter and Rahim's. We both gave that to him. Don't create unnecessary trouble for yourself. There is no need for it. 
calm down, get a teacher, and start to learn the language. Rahim is crazy about you, and I'm sure that he is not sleeping with you now for very good reasons. The man cannot take his eyes off of you. Everybody in this country knows that. You have to be smart about these things, Muji, and you are a smart girl. Think of it this way. If you learn the language, you'll be able to speak with more people in the world, you'll be able to speak with your daughter on the one hand, and then on the other hand, you will endear yourself more to Rahim. He speaks Yoruba fluently. It would mean a lot to him that you took the time to learn his language. Muji calmed down, but continued to cry. Adiwali consoled her some more and encouraged her to go back to her room. He was afraid that someone might have seen her come to his room. When he expressed this concern, she told him that nobody saw her because she came through his secret tunnel. She locked the doors behind be before she came to him, she explained, so everybody would think that she was asleep in her room. Moji did take Adiwale's advice and hired a tutor to teach her Hausa, which only pre pleased Rahim more, and he spoke in glowing terms about her to Adiwale. If Rahim appeared crazy about Moji, he was hopelessly in love with Amina. The toddler was like an angel in his life. He would use every opportunity available to him, even with his busy schedule of being the president of the country, to spend time with her. He talked about her all the time to the press, and he would have her brought down to the office to meet some of his guests. The little girl took everything in and responded appropriately to her father's doting on her. And each time Adiwali saw her, which was every day, he had to admit to himself that she was like an angel. Muji had a second baby girl who was named Zainab, and Rahim was ecstatic when she arrived. It continued to be a great puzzle to Adiwale about the complexities of the man. He could be ruthless as shown by the way he dictated to the country. He removed his enemies like you get rid of flies. He would not hesitate to kill anyone who stood in his way like the ex-president who had been his colleague and good friend, but at the same time, it was obvious that he loved his children and Muji a lot. His relationship with his other wives was also complex. He respected his first wife, Iya, a relationship in which she was truly his confidant. She was in charge of all the children, 13 in number. Muji's two daughters and the others who were all boys, three from her and four from the second and third wives. The sons lived or were in schools abroad and their mothers spent their time between the United States with them and their home outside of Zuru. It was only Iya who lived with Muji and Rahim in Lagos. Iya was very motherly, a little fat, and very warm. It was obvious to Adiwale that she loved Amina a lot, and the little girl always ran to hug her. Adiwale saw Nkem and General Ike for the first time since the coup. When they came to the palace for the meeting of all the governors, Nkem was pregnant at this time, and when she saw Adiwale at the reception line, she had to control herself not to run to him and hug him. Later in the banquet hall, she and her husband came over to him, and they both hugged him with a lot of affection. Nkem kissed him on the lips. They told him that they were very happy to see him and invited him to their home in the east whenever he was able to get away from his busy job. Adiwale watched the two of them all through the meetings and the receptions, and they seemed truly in love with one another. He felt a twinge of jealousy and wondered if he would ever feel that way about a woman. General Ike looked very happy. He and his wife touched one another at every opportunity they had, and it came shown. Adiwale looked at her and at Muji and wondered at the two beautiful women who had been his, but he had given them up in order to win something else. He asked himself if it was worth it. He concluded that giving Moji up had been worth it because he did not love her. Of the two, he had loved Nkem more. Nkem had a good heart, and even though she had her ambitions, she was kinder. She had settled into a life with the not very rich and not corrupt General Ike, and she was content. She had chosen Ike over him, even though at the time, he was much richer than Ike, and Nkem knew it. He experienced some regrets, but he convinced himself that giving up Nkem had helped the success of the coup. Later on in the day, when he again ran into Nkem, she hugged him, and he returned her hug with genuine affection. 
He told her that he could see that she was very happy and he was happy that he had a hand in it. She kissed him again. With Zainab's arrival, Muji finally resigned herself to the fact that Iya would always be there and that she would be more important to her children than she could ever hope to be. Iya took care of her, good care of her and pampered her in the days after she had the baby. Even though Muji tried her hardest to hate the woman, Iya would always counter whatever hostility Muji showed her with understanding and love. Adewale observed this and concluded that Iya was a woman who knew that even though her husband loved the younger woman for her beauty, her youth, and what she represented to him socially, she would always be his confidant and that she would come first in her, ch in her children's lives. That was her revenge on Muji as it had been of the other two wives. She had worked hard at it and she became very important to Zainab as she had with Amina. Rahim called Adiwali to his bedroom two weeks after the baby was born. He thanked him again for his loyalty and for giving him Muji and to show his gratitude, he gave him a contract to build a dam in the Eastern region. This was the biggest infrastructure development that his administration was undertaking. They were going to build to dam the B River Benue at the same point to generate electricity in the north eastern region and southeastern part of the country. Also with the damming of the river and its dredging southward from the dam, navigation on the river would improve and be a significant boost to the local economy in terms of transportation of people and goods as well as fishing. It was a contract that was going to run into some $50 billion over a period of five years. Adiwale was astounded at the offering. Rahim became a bigger puzzle to him because he could have given the contract. He could have taken the contract for himself or given it to one of his many close friends and associates from his own ethnic group. He accepted the contract and thanked Rahim by saluting and prostrating to him in obeisance and offering him his undying love and devotion. He called the big mafia chief from Ajegule, Big Daddy, whom he had recently met and whom he knew that he would need on his side. And in order for Big Daddy to become indebted to him for life, he gave him the contract. In that way, Adiwale continued to appropriate power for himself wherever he could. The gesture from Adiwale was unbelievable to Big Daddy. Adiwale coveted the power to have people do his bidding at all times and to be able to tell people when to go and when to come. He had made that his life goal. He had devoted much of his life to cultivating friendship of people whom he detested, as in the case of a lot of his foreign friends that he went to school with in England and the USA. Most of them he could not stand for all that they represented in his mind, from the color of their skin to the politics of their governments, especially the Caucasian and specifically the English. But he had courted and wooed them until they fell in love with him. And to most of them, Adewale had become a man that they loved. He continued to work hard on the many friendships, nurturing them the way you nurture a marriage that you would like to survive and not end up in divorce. He was independently wealthy, worked some $2 million, and his wealth had continued to grow on a daily basis from investments. He had not stolen a dime from the government of the country as he had promised himself and the many contracts that had come his way since the last one Rahim gave him to build the schools in the northern part of the country. He had been passing them out to his friends and associates without accepting any kickbacks. In that way, he continued to secure their friendships and loyalty. A lot of people owed him and they owed him big. Another reason that he did not want to steal money from the government was the very thing that he had been afraid of all along. And that was happening in neighboring Ghana with Flight Lieutenant Jerry Rollins calling all the people who had stolen from the Ghanaians to book and having them shot. He was too careful a man for that. And he did not think that any amount of money in the world was worth that kind of risk. I don't have to be stinking rich. All I need is to have friends who are stinking rich and who owe me with their lives. That is all a man needs. He told himself many times. Since joining the army, he had made it his business to know which 
government official embezzled which money and in what amount. He had a list of every man who had ever stolen a cent from the government. He needed this to keep the people in check and answerable to him so he could spring any of these at any time on the culprit. Even though Big Daddy and Adiwali were from Igbo Eliri, they did not meet until Rahim became the president and Adiwali became his aide-de-camp. Big Daddy knew of Adiwali as everyone in the small town had known of their golden son, but Adiwali did not know of him. Two months after the coup in 1974, the king of Igbo Eliri invited Big Daddy, who as far as the king knew was a successful businessman and an important son of the town to his palace to ask him to speak with Adiwali. The king felt that since their son was now in government, the town should reap certain benefits like construction of roads, pipe bone water, and electricity, as well as a hospital, so the people of the town would not have to travel the over 100 miles to Ibado to receive health care. When Big Daddy finally did speak with Adiwale on the phone, after requesting an audience from the presidential palace, he told him that the king of their town sent him. Adiwale initially was not thrilled about the request. He did not want the people of Igbo Eliri making demands on him. He did not want to play favoritism. But Big Daddy was persistent about the need to meet with him. He told him that he knew him very well, and he knew his mother and his grandmother as well, and that he was sure that Adiwale would like the two women to remain in good health. Adiwale thought that he heard an unconcealed threat in Big Daddy's tone. He asked him if he was being threatened, and the older man denied threatening him. The good health of all the people of Igbo Eliri depends on the meeting. I know that your mother and grandmother live in the town, and I don't think they will move to the big city, even if you ask them to do so. Adiwale agreed with him to meet with him, and they set a date and time. After the phone conversation with Big Daddy, he asked the head of security at the presidential palace to get him all the information that he could on Big Daddy and he was furnished with a criminal investigation department folder on the man the following day. After he read the file thoroughly, he asked for the original copy of the folder, telling the head of security that Rahim requested it. When this was brought to him, he destroyed everything in the file and kept the copy for himself. Adiwale realized that he and Rahim were going to, <laughs> to need Big Daddy's services from time to time. They met about a week later, and Adewale was surprised at the size of the man. He had expected someone much bigger and menacing in look, befitting his name, and he liked the older man immediately. Big Daddy discussed King, the king's request, and Adewale promised him that he would see what he could do about them. Adewale told Big Daddy that he had heard a lot about him with his reputation of helping people get revenge on the people who had wronged them. Big Daddy admitted that it was true. We will be needing your services from time to time. The president, I mean, Adiwale told him, and the older man assured him that he would be honored to be of help to the president. Two months after this meeting, Adiwale invited Big Daddy to the palace and gave him an assignment. In Kano, a man in his 50s named Ranka Dede had been harassing the citizens for years. He was a local mafia boss and his specialty was armed robbery and kidnapping of young girls most of whom were sold across the Sahara Desert into sex slavery. Ranka Dede, over the years, had grown extremely powerful, such that he was able to control the local politics of the city and its environment. His methods of stealing from people was endless, and no amount of money or property was too small for him to steal from anyone, and no one was too young to be his victim. He also had a harem of some 20 women, most of them under the age of 30. He married young girls, usually 13 or 14 years old, almost every year to replenish the harem and prevent it from dwindling down, as almost every year, one or more of his older wives would die in one mysterious way or the other. All of these had been causing concerns for the people of Kanu, but they had felt powerless to do anything about him. The police could not touch him, and a police chief who once dared arrest some of his men some five years before was killed along with his family when his house went up in flames. Ranka Dede had also become the wealthiest man in the city. His audacity was astounding. 
If anyone bought a new car in the city of about a quarter of a million people, Rankadede would have the car stolen in the next few days and boldly drive the car around the city for all to see. He was so primitive in his greed and he had to have it all and he could not allow anyone have more than him. His boldness increased to such an extent that his men would call or send letters to the homes of their future victims, informing them of their intent to rob them and instructing these people to have all their properties packed and ready for them so as not to waste their time when they arrived to conduct the robbery. A month after Rahim assumed office, Ranka Dede, who knew the power he had over the people in the northern part of the country, tested himself by coming down to Lagos and requesting a meeting with the president. Adewale refused to allow him meet with Rahim. The man disgusted him, and he felt like personally taking a gun and shooting him. Ranka Dede harassed him on the phone for days, asking for audience to see Rahim, and finally frustrated, he threatened that he would go to Ibueleri and kill his mother and grandmother. Adewale took the threat very seriously and moved his mother and grandmother in with him in the aide camp quarters in the palace, even though his grandmother protested, preferring to remain in Ibueleri with her friends. He promised himself that Ranka Dede would pay for making him afraid. He did not like to be threatened in any way, and he personally felt that the man should be killed, as he was just too dirty and disgusting to be allowed to draw breath. Adewale spoke to Rahim about him, but Rahim said that they had to be very careful for the stability of the country. This in itself coming from Rahim nauseated him. Rankadidi was finally able to wangle his way to speak with Rahim when the latter visited Kanu, and on the request of the governor of the northern region, Rahim met with him. Adiwale was at the meeting, and Rankadidi, who had grown to hate him as much as Adiwale hated him too, did not want him at the meeting. He mentioned this to Rahim, speaking in Hausa language. Rahim told him that Adiwale would remain, and that Adiwale spoke fluent Hausa. Rankadidi wanted money from the government. He told Rahim that he should give him $10 million if he wanted him to stop harassing the people of Kano. Adewale could not close his mouth for a long time after Rankadidi made the request. He could not put his finger on what exactly his problem was. Idiocy? Or is it just that he's so used to getting the things he wanted that he had made him into an imbecile? He didn't even ask for a contract as a disguise and then steal all the money and not execute the contract or pretend to have executed the contract as a lot of people like him do. He just opened his stinking mouth and asked for the money. Some people are just too stupid to be allowed to draw breath, he said to himself again and again. Rahim probably, because he was older or because he was from the north and received similar requests from some of the people of this region who felt entitled to the country's treasury was not surprised by Rankadede's demands. He calmly explained to him the way he talked to an infant that such things could not be done. He told him that though he was the president of the country, the money of the country was not his to do as he pleased and that he would not respond to Rankadede's blackmailing him. Rahim dismissed him after telling him this. Rankadede stood up from where he had been seated across from Rahim he looked up at Adewale, who was standing behind Rahim. He snapped his thumb and his middle finger in a gesture of promising to get even with him. Adewale shook his head. He could not believe the childishness of the 55-year-old psychopath. And he resolved in his mind to personally help the people of Kano get rid of him, even though he, as a Yoruba man, did not feel touched by their plight. If the stupidity of the man was unbelievable to, Ad to Adewale because of this interaction, he was so sick that he actually threw up when one week later, two Hausa students came to the palace to demand an audience with him. This was a rare kind of request from young people and he stopped all he was doing and attended to them immediately. They were from the university in Kano and they were both 18 years old and best friends. Aminu Ishaku just lost his father who had killed himself the day before and his 18-year-old half-sister whom Rankadede killed two days earlier. Rankadede had married his beautiful half-sister five years before when he blackmailed and threatened his family. 
She had two children for him. Amina's father was a trader and would go to Dubai to buy jewelry, which he would sell in Kano. His business had been doing very well, and he had recently returned from a trip, bringing with him jewelry that he was able to sell pretty rapidly to the women who were preparing for a festival. He netted the most pro profit he had ever made in his life, and he deposited the money in his account in the bank. Three nights ago, Ranka Dede went to Aminu's father and asked him for the money that he made from his sale, and he refused. He attacked him and beat him so much that he broke his left arm. Ranka Dede stayed the night in his house. In the morning, he drove his father-in-law to the bank at gunpoint and asked him to withdraw all the money and hand it over to him. Aminu's father did. Rankadidis took everything from him, even though people had been at the bank. Nobody tried to stop him because they were afraid they might be his next victims. Aminu's father went back home and started to cry. Family members gathered around and they were all upset. People said that it was unacceptable behavior and that Rankadidis had done enough and had to be stopped. So the family members, numbering up to 30, encouraged Aminu's father to go to the police and that they would go with him and demanded that Rankadede be arrested. So Aminu's father, encouraged by his family, and with a whole lot of them behind him, went to the police station to file the report. When they got there, Rankadede and the chief of police were eating lunch right there at the desk. Aminu, Aminu's father panicked so much that he broke into a run out of the police station and onto the street where he was hit by a passing motorcycle. He broke his left leg. His family took him to the hospital and the doctors put his left leg and arm in casts. Later in the day, the family received the sad news that his sister was dead. Ranka Dede had gone home after he saw Amino's father at the police station and he told her that her father had the impudence to go to the police to report him. Therefore, as a lesson to her father and the other people in the town, he stabbed her to death. When Aminu's father heard the news of his daughter's death, he went into his room and ate his gum. Aminu therefore came to Adewale for help. This should not be allowed to continue. It should not. He pleaded with Adewale as he and his best friend, Saliu Subiru, crouched on the floor in Adewale's office in tears and appealed to him. That was when Adewale excused himself from the young men, went into his bathroom and vomited his breakfast. He returned, asked his secretary to take the young men to his quarters, feed them and give them money for their transportation to return home to Kano and money to bury their father and sister. Later that day, Adewale called Big Daddy and gave him the assignment. The following day, Ranka Dede and 40 of his men in his organization, some of whom were his sons, died in a fire that gutted his estate. Aminu and Salu returned two days later to thank Adewale and to promise their undying love and loyalty to him. Adewale and Big Daddy thus became close friends, and the older man started to help him with his business dealings and some of his investments in real estate all over Lagos Island. Adewale found in Big Daddy a person he could trust absolutely with his money and with his life, and he made sure that a lot of government contracts went to the older man. So when Rahim gave him the contract to build the dam, that June of 1975, he invited Big Daddy to take care of it for him. Big Daddy invited many construction companies to bid on the contract, and he eventually narrowed the bidders down to 10. The average amount of money that these 10 companies were asking for the building of the dam was $20 billion. $30 billion less than the amount that the government knowingly voted for the contract. Big Daddy finally settled on the contract on the company Strummers, and upon their being cleared by the federal government, signed over the $50 billion to the company's president, Kiergaard. The company issued a receipt to the nation's government for $50 billion and later transferred $30 billion to Big Daddy's account in Switzerland. On Adewale's instructions, Big Daddy transferred $5 billion to Rahim's account, retained $2 billion for himself, and disbursed the remaining amount of money to all the top government officials. 
most of them generals in the army, to ensure that they continue to be indebted to him. What remained after all these disbursements was a billion dollars that Adewale instructed Big Daddy to spend on Igbo Eliri and its many neighboring villages for the roads, schools, hospitals, electricity, and pipe-borne water that the king requested. Rahim's administration continued the policy of total and central control of the government. Everything had to be approved from the presidential palace and no region could have independent sources of income. All the public services in the country were also under the control of the federal government and the palace could not allow any private organization function without their approval. This had the effect of crippling the country and in preventing development in the right direction in all sectors from industry to health care of the country. The country at this time was earning money from petroleum and the government started to undertake many developmental projects. Roads were being built, bridges were being constructed, as well as hospitals and universities. Contracts were being issued to favorite friends and families without any regard for accountability. A lot of people courted Rahim for these reasons when he had become the president and they had to go through Adewale. Aid accounts to important military officers have unique powers of their own, which Adewale was aware of and that he utilized to his advantage as well. Very soon, it became the standard that if anyone wanted to see the president, they had to go through him. He was the one to decide who met with Rahim, and if he did not want a particular person to meet with him, the person could not. This increased his power and hold on people as more and more people became indebted to him. This power that he had angered many constituents, especially the northerners, who tried to see the president for one favor or the other. Complaints started to filter to Rahim, but he did not do anything about it. He knew that Adewale would protect him with his life, and he trusted him totally. As a result, Adewale was able to influence a lot of policy and the way things were done in the country. He was able to arrange positions in government to people who were appropriate for the job and not as a result of nepotism. For the first time after independence, a military doctor was the federal commissioner for health, and a lawyer was the federal commissioner in charge of the judiciary. A man who had spent most of his life as a school principal became the commissioner for education. The northerners were not happy about this. They felt that they were being sidelined and positions that rightfully belonged to them had been stolen from them, along, although the northern applicants were neither qualified nor had the education for the jobs. So the southerners, who were more qualified, got the jobs. Some things were done on merit for the first time in the country. They blamed Rahim for surrounding himself with a Yoruba wife and a Yoruba aide camp. Although his Yoruba wife had nothing to do with any of it, Muji made sure she stayed out of polit politics. She did what she was asked to and spent the rest of her time on her fashion, her friends, and competing with her husband's first wife for her children's affection. Whenever anyone approached her for asking her for one favor or the other, she made it clear that she did not involve herself in such things. So in 1976, two years after Rahim became the president, some military officers and civilians from the northern part of the country decided to do something about Adewale. They had a series of meetings. Some of them suggested that he should be killed, like in an accident, because they intuitively knew that as a power broker, he had come to stay. They recognized his genius and his charms and saw him as a formidable enemy. Others felt that it was more important for him to be discredited so as to teach Rahim a lesson about trusting him, a Yoruba person, and that it would convince him to appoint a Hausa officer as his aide-de-camp. But at the same time, they realized that it might not be an easy task inasmuch as Rahim trusted Adiwale absolutely. Finally, they decided to accuse him of plotting a coup to overthrow Rahim. And if they could find enough evidence to prove this, Rahim would not have a choice but to have him killed. One of the men, General Issa, assured the other men that he would find the evidence. He had a spy in the president's palace who would be able to monitor Adiwale's comings and goings so that they could pin something on him. The spy he had in the palace was Rahim's second wife, who was his lover. Amina turned four years old in October of 1976, and Rahim arranged a very big celebration for her. 
All his children and their mothers arrived about 10 days before the big event. After the party, which was held on a Saturday evening, Rahim's second wife approached him with the request to discuss an important matter with him. He went with her to her bedroom, where she told him that a man had come to her in the market just that morning and asked her to give him a letter and that the man had stressed to her that the letter was very important because it could be a matter of life or death for Rahim. She handed the letter to him. He took the letter from her and read it. In detail, the letter explained all of Adiwali's activities of the last week and that he was planning a coup to overthrow his boss. Some of his supposed accomplices were mentioned in the letter and all of them were Yoruba generals and top government officials. Rahim read the letter calmly and asked the, his wife why her lover was lying. She became flustered and denied the fact that the man was her lover, that she had never met him until he approached her and gave her the letter that morning. She had been so afraid that he recognized her and she had feared for her life as well. Rahim looked at her for a long time, shook his head in regret and walked out of the room. He had known she was having an affair with General Issa for the past two years, and that was the reason that he had asked her and his third wife to go and make their homes with their children who were in schools in Boston in the USA. He had not been able to trust either of them since he married them, but they were the mothers of his children, and he did not see any point in divorcing them. He decided that they could have affairs if they wanted, but he did not want them having it under his nose. He left her and went to his room and read the letter again. He did not believe any of it because he knew that Adiwale, though very ambitious, was not a stupid man. He was someone who believed that the right man should do a job that he was qualified to do and had steered affairs in such a way that it happened with his cabinet. Adiwale knows very much that a Yoruba-dominated coup would not succeed and as such, he would not plan one. After all, with the coup that made him president, Adiwale made it clear to him at the time they, that they needed an Igbo general and one who would have been perceived as an enemy too because he had worked for the secession of the Republic. He had explained the need to involve an enemy on their side and it had helped the coup's success. He also realized that Adiwale's life was in danger. He did love him, even though he was wary of him and his ambitions, but he acknowledged to himself that Adiwale had served him very well. He had given him his beautiful wife and he had given him his two daughters, who had given him his two daughters, whom he loved more than anything in the world. He felt protective of him and decided that the time had come for him to move on. The following Monday, he called Adiwale to his bedroom and told him that he would be promoted to the rank of Brigadier General, a position that he had promised him for a while. And as befitting the rank, he would not continue to be his aide de camp. He would have to move on to bigger things. Rahim's plan was to give him the promotion and send him to the United States as the military attache to the country's embassy. It would remove him from the country for a while and ensure his safety. He was convinced that Adiwale's life was in danger at home, as the people who had accused him of plotting a coup actually wanted him dead. He was surprised that they did not make the attempt on his life first. Initially, he did not inform Adiwale about his plans to send him to the USA. He spoke only about the promotion and then asked him what post he wanted. Adiwale was surprised that he was being promoted. He did not think that it would ever happen. He thanked Rahim as usual and asked if he had displeased him in any way. Was that why he could not be the aide de camp anymore? Rahim assured him that he had not. He told Rahim that he would like to appoint him as the external affairs minister for the country. You can't be the foreign minister, Rahim started. Other countries will not want to deal with us. As it is, we are being criticized and accused of human rights violations. They feel that we should be running a democracy here and they will not welcome you in army uniform coming to discuss, discuss foreign issues with them. I'm not very happy with the man who has the job at this time. I think you should suggest someone that you feel would do a better job. I have always trusted your judgment. I am sure you will agree with me that somebody with as much education as possible will be good. Other foreign ministers wouldn't intimidate such a person. Pick someone and I will go along with you. Rahim paused 
and gave everybody a chance to look. When I think that you should, what I think you should do for the next two or three years is to go to the United States and be the military attache there, he continued. It will do us a lot of good, and with your charms and ways with these white people, I know that you will represent us well. The USA is a country that we really need on our side, and you will be able to quiet their criticism some, I trust. I didn't want to recognize that he was being sent into exile. He concluded that it must be one of two things. Rahim was afraid of him, or Rahim knew that his life was in danger. Either way, it was for his safety. He looked at the man that in some ways he had come to love like a father and had the urge to go over and hug him. Adu, uh, Rahim continued to look at him with deep affection and some sadness. Adewale saluted and thanked the older man who said to him, Come here, you rascal. He went over to Rahim and the older man embraced him and patted him on the back. I have your back, Adewale, he told him. Adewale replied, I know, sir. Adewale had been dating a beautiful doctor at the clinic in the presidential palace. She wanted to marry him, but he could not bring himself to commit to her. Before he left home, he decided to, he left, he decided to end the relationship, and he arrived in the USA, a 41-year-old bachelor. He hated the job in the embassy within a month of arriving there and assessing the situation and knowing what his job involved in details. He thought of things to do to spend his time, but could find nothing fulfilling enough. He missed the job of being the president's aide-de-camp, even with its crazy schedule. Two months after his arrival, when he had made the rounds of the Washington diplomatic circle and joined the corporate clubs and organizations and taken up golf, he decided that he would enroll in a doctorate program. His reasons were twofold. He realized that he could be dismissed from the army at any time, and he wanted to have a profession to fall back on. It was obvious that he had some powerful enemies, otherwise he would not have been sent into exile. And secondly, he really wanted the job of the external affairs minister. The person who eventually got the job was a college professor with a doctorate degree. Adewale did believe that if he had a doctorate degree, he could have gotten the minister's position, even though Rahim's reasons for sending him out of the country were clear to him. So he called up his boss and asked for permission to pursue the degree. Rahim teased him about getting more and more degrees. He asked him what it was with the Yoruba people and their love of school. He gave him permission and told him that he should build the government for his tuition. Adewale enrolled in the Department of Political Science at Harvard University and embarked on a doctoral program. He started to spend half of his time at his boring job in Washington, D.C. and the other half in Boston. While he was in Washington, D.C., he did what Rahim instructed him to do. He charmed the several representatives of the many countries in the diplomatic circle, and whenever his government was criticized for running a dictatorship, he had a different twist on the issue. Harping on the complexities of the country based on the many diverse ethnic groups and that the country was taking her time working things out and thus the need for the army to be in government for the time being. He was very persuasive and convincing. He became a good representative of his home country to the world. He also developed a vast number of indispensable friends with the many representatives of the many countries in the city. Washington responded to his charm and good looks, and he was always invited to the right parties. He was a man who had learned to make the best of any situation he found himself and not wasting time whining. Within a year of being in Washington, the intensity of the criticism of his country decreased. Back at home, many people were pleased that he was no longer the aide de camp to the president. And because he was replaced with the major who was a house of man, the northerners had better access to Rahim. However, his stay in the U.S. had to be cut short after two years because he was privy to a coup that was being planned. Rahim was not, had, not only had enemies at home, he had enemies abroad as well, and it had to do with the mining of diamonds a European company, Vetro, wanted to be allowed to explore and excavate diamonds found in the northeastern part of the country, but the government would not issue them a license to do so. Rahim personally denied them the license because General Issa, who was his second wife's lover, was a major shareholder in the company. And secondly, 
he wanted a predominantly domestic company to be the one excavating for the precious stone. He did not want a repetition of the problem the country was having concerning petroleum and the foreign countries co companies that were drilling and exploring for oil in the Delta region of the country. General Issa and the people in Vetro were not happy about this and wanted Rahim out. The people of this region in the Middle Eastern to Northern part of Nigeria were not thrilled either. These were the Gulugu people, a minority group of about 100,000. They were gentle people, mostly farmers and fishermen. The government since Rahim took office had been molesting them. First with the collect construction of the dam on their waters, which had not really benefited them. Instead, it had disrupted their way of life, especially with regards to fishing, since it diverted water away from the many rivers around their villages, leaving them no option but to travel farther by road that was not available to be able to fish. The dam also brought with it a lot of waterborne diseases like river blindness and sleeping sickness. The people appealed to the government to help them with curbing the illnesses that were leaving them either dead or debilitated, but nothing was done. The roads that they had asked for to have better access to the dam river were not provided, neither was better health care. Now the government told them that they found diamonds in their land and wanted to mine them. It was the last thing they wanted or needed. Adewale at the time was dating a Yoruba graduate who had been a past winner of the country's beauty pageant. The relationship for him was just to while the time away. He had no intention of making a commitment to her. He was also aware of the fact that she dated other women, one of whom was General Issa. Adewale knew that he was also seen Rahim's second wife who lived in Boston, but he did not know that Issa had a hand in his removal as aide-de-camp to Rahim. On a particular day when he visited his girlfriend, she had to leave on some errands when he arrived in her apartment. She wanted him to join her, but he was very tired since he had just arrived from Boston. He decided that he would take a short nap while she was away. 45 minutes after she left, a package arrived for General Issa that had to be signed for. Adewale accepted the package and signed a false name for it. It was from Vetro. He was aware of the problems that the company was having in obtaining a license to mine diamonds, and he knew that Isa was involved. He left the apartment before his girlfriend returned, taking the package with him. He went to his office in the embassy and opened it. There was a single piece of paper containing scripted messages in code, eight lines long. He did not want to use the embassy security system to decode the message, so he called up a friend of his, Jack, who worked for the CIA, and told him that he needed a huge favor. They decided to meet the following day on the golf course to talk. Jack and Adewale had become friends when he first arrived in Washington. An acquaintance from his Oxford days introduced them to each other, hoping that Jack would introduce Adewale to the social life in Washington, D.C., Jack had not done that since he was an introvert, but Adewale, who also courted anyone he wanted as much as he could, had not left him alone, especially with the fact that Jack was a senior official in the CIA who could become useful to him one day. Jack met with Adewale the week he arrived in town and took him out to lunch to satisfy their mutual friend. Following the lunch day, Adewale had noticed his discomfort and concluding that he preferred to be left alone would not leave him alone. He frequently invited Jack to play golf with him and to play ball games. After four months of persistent invitations, which Jack continued to refuse, but which Adewale would not take no for an answer, Jack gave in and played golf with him. Adewale did his best to charm the man with jokes and stories that by the end of the day, when he invited him to a party at the embassy, Jack accepted. Jack at the age of 43 was not dating, he told Adewale when he when bugged about it, that fo following his divorce some 10 years before, he had not bothered. Adewale promised that he would find him a good and pretty girl to date, and he took the assignment very seriously. He continued to invite Jack to the many parties that he got invited to and started to introduce him to a lot of young women. Finally, Jack met Elaine through Adewale. Elaine was a secretary at the International Monetary Fund, and as far as Adewale was concerned, she was the nicest white girl he had ever met. 
He felt that she was the best person for his introverted friend at the CIA. He told Jack about Elaine, arranged dinner with him, Elaine himself and the beauty queen whom he had just met at the time. And that was it. Jack and Elaine fell for one another. And nine months later, when they got married, Adiwale was the best man at his wedding. Adiwale took the scripted messages to Jack the following day and he destroyed the packaging. Jack promised to decipher the codes and get back to him in two days. He called the following day, however, and suggested they meet at the park. He had all the information for him. Later that day at the park with their lunches in brown bags, Adiwale was puzzled when his friend told him that the message was a poem. Line one, the king wears his shoes on his head and his crown on his feet. Line two, the king runs away from his subjects on his special day. Line three, the queen goes to the rising of the sun instead of going to the special day and she takes the princesses. Line four, members of the royal court wear red. Line five, his special day is the day of doom. Line six, he who is from the rising of the sun wears his crown on his feet on the king's special day. Line seven, he who is from the setting of the sun must not return home. Line eight, he who lives on the way to the holy land comes down to the end of the river and wears the crown on his head. Here ends chapter five. We ended it at page 151. I want to thank you for tuning into my channel. This is Olushola Tawo again, who just happens to be the cousin of this amazing author, Kende Adeola Ayemi. If you like what you've heard or any of the previous chapters, please email the author directly. Her email address is her first name, Kende, her last name, Ayemi, the number 26, at gmail.com. You can also email her to order a copy of your own. This book is awesome and I really think it's a fantastic, fantastic read and also makes a great gift for someone that you would like to read something along with you. It's also great for a book club as well. Okay, here's yours truly signing out right now. Like my video, share it, view other videos on my channel, Bye for now, and you have yourself an awesome day. Ciao.